Andy, what, what about you? Do you? Are you curious about other sports? Is that something you've always had? Rugby strikes me. Um, rugby union and rugby league were always like, oh, these are totally different sports. But then about 30 years ago, rugby union was like, actually, they're very similar sports. <laughs> Maybe we should be stealing some of their clothes. So rugby kind of has had that kind of natural sense of uh, openness anyway, probably because a bit of it was foisted on it. What, what's your interest in this and take on that? Yeah, I think... Um as Michal said there, you never stop learning and uh, you know, from Australia we have a huge rugby league AFL community. Um, we'd, we've, I've done a, traditionally a lot of learning um, in meeting up with those coaches. Rugby tends to be reasonably tight so you can't really head across to another rugby club and have a chat but uh, very, very open there in the rugby league and AFL. Um, but when I came here it was, uh, I was actually really excited about you know, meeting people from the GAA and, and you know, great chat there with me all and we, we shared a few coffees and uh, you know as you said there correctly it's the change rooms are very similar we're, we're driven people um, we probably get that that uh, that tag of being a little bit strange because we are head coaches and and we do pretty much your, your whole day 24 hours is, is how can we how can we get better how can we stretch ourselves how can we challenge our team to be the best version of themselves and um, yeah, it's just great to sit down and talk to another like-minded person on that. And, and yeah, you know, I got a, a saying there: if you if you if you stop growing, you're dying. You know, so you got to you got to keep you got to keep learning and uh, you know having that opportunity to come in to to talk to me all and, and others here. It's it's been really really refreshing. What what's the AFL stuff that you're able to take? Is it um, specifically like kicking and catching? Is it more than that? Initially, it was. So when I was a skills coach, it was a, a lot around that. Um, as you go through the coaching your coaching career, your, your mindset changes a little bit. So as a head coach now, it's more, and I did some work with Essen and the Bombers, which is actually my team back home. Uh, managed to sit down with them for uh, three or four days before I came over here and, and just looked at the, at the way that they, they set up their structures and... Uh, uh, yeah, just communication. To me, the biggest things around language, like around management structures, and management structures. But but just the way they, you know, I think everything, everything revolves around communication for me. It's how we communicate to our, our staff, our players. Um, you know, the language that we use, the culture that we have, uh, and it's just great to see that you know, it doesn't matter what size budget you've got, and they've got a hell of a big budget. Um, but it comes back down to the, the simplicity of the language and the culture that's been driven there. And so that was refreshing as well. Sometimes you, you, know, you look from outside and you think, uh, it's going to be really special in there. It's got to be, it's got to be different. It'll be like Man City, it's got to be different. Well, the culture's probably different because that's what's been set up. But it's, it's, it's the, the humility, the simple stuff that in life, in any relationship, whether it's a, a personal relationship, a business relationship, a sporting relationship, the simplicity of that language and the connection of the people is what makes it makes it work. At this time of the year for you, Andy, is it a sort of situation where the evolution is at its most pronounced because you're between seasons, or is that something that you're constantly looking to do between each game and every single day as Connacht boss? You get a bit more time in the off season because you haven't got that, you know, the weekend, uh, the, the normal weekend routine of play, review, preview, get back on the treadmill and off you go again. So, yeah, we, we spent last week, um, we're actually, the boys are on the down week this week, we've had a, a pretty solid three-week block, but last week the front end of that was all around our cultural piece and, and how we, uh, we worked on the, the cultural piece that we had from the previous year. We just adjusted a few things. We actually brought the academy in for the first time ever, which was great. We had 90 people in a room and, and committed to a, a promise, we call them, and... Um, and then out of that, uh, selected our leadership group and, and a set of behaviours, which is all well and good. It's now about living that and making sure that we, um, you know, we don't just put it on a, on a wall. Uh, so you get that a little bit more time at this time of year to be able to do that. At the same time, um, you let loose the athletic performance coaches too, and, <laughs> and they tend to get very excited this time of year. And uh, they, they've done a great job. Our fellows are definitely looking forward to this week off. And, I'll come back bigger and, and stronger next week. That's the culture side. What about the game plan side? Because obviously it's great to have a, a perfect culture, but you, you need to have a style of play that everybody understands and that, get, that comes down to your communication again. Um, installing that game plan, again, it's great. It's, it's, um, I, I don't know how high intensity the tackling is or if you're allowed to, if it's full, bore, full contact. Um, how important is this time of year? Because... You, you can't trial things in the white heat of battle, but you kind of need to get people confident enough to trial things in the white heat of battle, if you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah, it's really important. So we, we call them our big rocks. So 
uh, if it's in our, in our defensive system, we've got three big rocks that, um, and, and real simple clarity around that. So what are the three big rocks that make our defensive system kind of defensive system? Um, in our attack, we've got the same. In our breakdown, we've got the same. In our forward pack, we've got the same. So th this early part of the season is just about instilling those big rocks and making sure that there's 100% clarity with that. Uh, you know, we've, we've kept a lot of what we did last year. Um, you must evolve, you must keep growing your game. So we've added a few new things in. We've had a bit of a trial period on a couple of different attacking shapes and, and things that, uh, you know, that we felt uh, after, the, after the season last year we could add to it. Um, a few of them we've, we're going to keep, a few of them no, we said we don't think it's going to work, so we've tossed that out. So it's a chance to play with your game structure as well. And Is the tossing the stuff out decision quite hard because you've invested a lot of time and energy and getting everybody up speed and then you're like, that didn't actually work? No, it's not hard, I think it's, um, but it's a reality of the game. You know, sometimes what looks good in theory and what looks, what looks good in, in, on the paper doesn't actually work. Um, and it's only when the, and we involve the players a hell of a lot with that because through our eyes as coaches, sometimes it can it can appear real simple, um, but we're not the ones out there in the heat of battle doing it. So, <laughs> so and then they come back and they go, that ain't going to work. And yeah. you go, well, how about we try this? And they try it and they go, that ain't going to work. You go, right, uh, yeah. it's not going to work. So what do we do now? And it's it's never about we'll tell you. It's about we ask the questions collectively. We then come up with what we perceive is or what we believe is going to be the best option for us, and we cement that in. So as we head into this next little block of three weeks. Uh, we'll cement our, our big rocks in and, and our key, key structures and we've got a game against Oinax in, in three and a half weeks' time and we'll give it a run there. You get the opportunity to roll it out. Yeah. Um, Is that something that you can relate to Andy late in the game? Sometimes the structure loosens a little bit and the game plan doesn't get abandoned, but it's certainly not adhered to as strictly as the first ten minutes of a game. Yeah, I think you, know, you enter every game with a thought on, how, on what's going to happen and... Uh, invariably it never pans out that way, very, very rarely does it pan out, so it's a very fluid uh, existence that you're in and um, yeah, my honest view on it is uh, if we're heading to the game and, and us as coaches get wiped out, the game's still going to go ahead and they're going to do exactly what we, we felt was going to be the right thing for them, so we, we try and remove ourselves from a lot of that decision making on the game and you know, you'll hear our voices from a, from a Connet point of view, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you hear a lot about you know, our thoughts, sharing that with players. Thursday, we tend to be a little bit quieter. Friday tends to be the players talking. Saturday, this is your, this is your game, boys. So, um, but how that, that whole fluidity of the game, um, you know, how that presents itself and what we do, that's hopefully we've instilled uh, their ability to read that and to adjust accordingly throughout the course of the, the season and the week. Can you tell us a bit about your, the, the rocks, the attacking rocks? Because um, when Connacht won the league um, four years ago now, they had this great attacking style that really energised the whole country. Like, the whole, at, at the time, the country was like, why can't the Irish team play a bit like this? And it was so exciting. And so many of those players became kind of um, household names in, in rugby in Ireland because of it. Um, it seemed like you were getting a little bit back towards that ability to kind of strike from deep and to free the players last season. Is that something that's, is that true? Is, that, is your attacking philosophy to, to be as wide as possible and to attack as often and as early as possible? Yeah, it is. I think, yeah, it, it's... To me, you, you've got to fill the field, so the field depends on what field you're at, but you know, maximum 75 metres in width. Now, if you, if you haven't got a bloke on either edge, let's say you got him even 10 metres in, well, it's now only 55 metres that, hmm. that they've got to defend. So, you know, get your markers out wide, um, open up space, have opportunities to be able to attack in all different areas. And I always say there's six zones to attack, um, and I'll tell you now, a defence will not cover six zones. They may cover five, but it's your ability to be able to see where that, that spare one is available. So we spent a lot of time on, um, we, we say, setting early scanning and, and using the right words to, to allow us to identify where that space is and then go for it. And who do, you, who do you charge with the responsibility to identify that? Is it everybody's job? It's, it's everyone's job. Yeah, it is. Now, Nigel Carroll's our attack coach. He does a brilliant job with that. And he, he works really hard on making sure that we've got all options available to us. Um, so if a prop sees it, they can call they can it and call tell everybody. It. They can call it, and, and then so we instill that power in the player. So if you call it and it wasn't on, right? I will probably have a chat on Monday, and yeah. you may not be playing next week. But if if you know, but you got that responsibility. You see it, and you go for your life. Off you go. Yeah. Um, because you can't have. You know, I think traditionally rugby's had. You know, they, they call it the game call. The game leader's the number ten and the number nine. Well, there's thirteen other blokes out there with 
you know, 26 sets of eyes or 26 eyes out there that you're now not using. Um, give them the, give them the, and keep it really simple. And it's all around, it's a numbers game, as it is in most things with sport. So if you've got three men on the short side, they've got two men on the short side, guess where the space is going to be? But you've got to be able to call that. And to empower them to do that. I yep. presume that's a very uh, invigorating environment for, for players to come into and go, OK, I suddenly have the opportunity to change the game as opposed to just kind of taking a little rest here as the pillar at the rook. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I go back many, many years ago I played, but um, to me the coaches I respected were the ones that, that allowed you to express yourself and allowed you to go out there. And, and, uh, and, and they used to come in at halftime and say, what are you seeing, Friendy? And I go, oh, I'm seeing this. But those blokes back then were really rare because mm -hmm. it was normally the coach coming in and telling you, this is what's happening. You know, why aren't you seeing this? You're thinking, that's not happening. Like, I'm out there playing the game. It's not happening. So my whole view on it is I responded to those coaches. So that's the coach that I believe uh, will get people to respond. And that's the coach I attempt to be and we attempt to be as a, as a collective group. And I will say I'm absolutely blessed with the group of coaches that we've got and the, and the players we've got. We've got a, 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 you know, a great squad and, and they are really receptive to that and, and that whole word empowerment. Yeah, we do. We give them a lot of power, um, but they respect that and they, and they use it wisely. Do you think that's helping to create a culture where those players who are leading the conversation in the dressing room and they identify the sort of things, are they the players who are going to become great coaches, do you think? Potentially, yeah, and that's, that's often the way it works. You know, if, if, again, if you try and micromanage everything, you're holding back so many, so many other thought processes and so many other um, expressions of, of attack, defence, whatever it is. Uh, so we, we try and open the whole thing up. Um, there are times when you've definitely got to say, nah, we, there's too many voices here, this is the way we're going to work it. But um, I think out of that you do, you get players that they start to see a different game because they're asked to see a different game. They're asked to, you know, to, to challenge their thinking on whether it's a defence or a line out or a restart, whatever it is. Um, where is the space? What are the options here? What's the hardest thing that you've got to defend? Why wouldn't we throw that back at the opposition? Uh, and, and you start to get them being cre creative and, and then they own it and it becomes theirs. And I think some of the things we saw last year with, um, with the kind of plays, the tip of it, tip of the iceberg, but you know, already in training, pre-season training this year, you can see uh, you know, blokes are wanting to try things. And I always say there's three types of error. There's a, there's a skill execution error. Um, we'll work with you on that. You, know, you, you own that as a player, but we own it too as a coach to try and work with you. There's a, a knowledge error. Again, we'll work with you on that. So we've got to get our message clearer, making sure you understand what's happening. And there's an a attitude error. Um, and we, we, we don't have many attitude errors at Connet. We don't. We have, we have errors in our game, but they tend to be skill and, and, and knowledge. So uh, it's the attitude errors. When you get too many of those, that bloke tends to drift out and mm. you might lose him at the end of the season. But um, thankfully, we don't have too many attitude errors at, at Connet. Um, Andy, what are your expectations? Do you, do you talk openly about what you want the team to do with with the public, or is it a are the internal team goals something that you you share? H how does that work? Uh, yeah, happy to share. I mean, we we um, I don't think you enter a competition not wanting to win it. Um, you know, we we've said this year coming that uh, we're in Champions Cup. We want to make the quarter final of that. That's going to stretch us, but that's that's definitely a target for us. Um, for the Pro 14, we want to make sure that we're, we've got a, a quarter final and we want to make sure that's a home quarter final this year. As we saw last year, we got there, but it wasn't our home stadium and, and we dipped out there. Every, every, uh, every team that had the home quarter final managed to get through. So that's, mm. that's another target for us. Um, really important. We want to make uh, the sports ground our fortress. So uh, last year, we're just under 80% just under of, of, uh, of our home games we won. We want to make that over, and ideally it's 100%, which, which to me is actually achievable. We've got a, no one did that last year in the Pro 14, not even the, the great Leinster, but yeah, we've, got a, we've got a great support group here, and we've got the Galway weather, which a lot of teams don't understand until they get here, so we've got to, we've got to turn that into an advantage for us, <laughs> which I think we can. Um, so that's a goal, and then continu continue to grow our Indigenous um, plays. We, we, you know, some great work being done through the academy with with Eric Elwood and, and his group of coaching staff and, and support staff. Uh, and we've got some really good young talent coming through Connet Rugby, which I, ideally you get them into, into the green jersey of Ireland. You know, and and we, still, we still hold a goal to get five players in a match day 23, if not more. So they're, they're simply, they're our goals for the year coming up. Um, pretty simple. And uh, you know, we talk about them, we, we believe in them, um, and we strive to get there. The, the Rugby World Cup squad hasn't been announced just yet. 
a couple of your guys are on the bubble and, and it could go either way. And um, how players respond to being selected is, is obviously hugely important, but how for the ones who don't make, and this is the same for anybody at Leinster and, and Munster as well, um, there is then an opportunity within the Ireland setup because there's, there's going to be a change in, in coaching ticket. Obviously, there's continuity and everything, but there is a firm stop after the World Cup and everything is rebooted again immediately afterwards. So that carrot for international selection has to be something that you... you, you it, it's certainly their motivation. And yeah. You, you must be aware of that too. Yeah, I think it's... You know, it's I think Joe's done a, an amazing job. But as we know, he's, he's, his tenure's coming to an end. So um, hopefully that finishes with success at the World Cup. That'd be great for, for Joe and for Ireland and everyone involved there. We'll wait and see what happens there. But yeah, that, that final whistle on whatever date the final is, I don't know what date it is, but uh, yeah, Andy Farrell takes over. And if you've been in that green jersey with Joe Schmidt, um, yeah, you've, you've done well there if you haven't. Uh, a new man comes in, you've got to try and impress that bloke. So, as you say, it's a reset button. Um, gives everyone a, a, fresh, a fresh start. Is there a noticeable trait or anything that the players are saying when they come back from Ireland camp, when they come back from working under Joe Schmidt? Is this a very different philosophy to how you operate? Um, it is a different philosophy. There's, uh, you know, we, we probably... So we have the big rocks. Um, we... Uh, we give a lot of ownership to the players. Um, I think because it's a national program, um, understandably, you have to be a bit more directive. Otherwise, you've got four provinces coming in with four different game styles. So you know, when they do come into, into that Irish camp, there's a very uh, strict way of, of, this is the way Ireland play, this is what we're about to do. So they've got to learn that. So they don't have the freedom, and, and nor should they, because you, know, you can't get Leinster, Munster, Connacht, Ulster all you know, tipping their two cents worth into the pot and saying, just go out and play that, you can't do that. So the one, the, probably the one thing that comes out is how intense it is and how intense, not just the training is, but the whole environment, you mm. know, that, that it's, you, you, you're on the whole time, which is good. And that's what your, your national program should be. So I think, uh, yeah, I think Joe and the national coach has done a great job with that. And, um, you know, there's a nervousness with every player that takes, that, that heads up to that camp knowing that it's going to be tough and you're going to have to be at your best to, to stay in there. That's interesting that you say that about a national team not being able to do things on the fly too much because ultimately you're in and out a little bit. Is it something that they can perhaps do now before a World Cup that they can perhaps try something a little bit different because they have so long with the players? This preseason is so long and then you have a full tournament as well. Yeah, I, I think we're going to see that in these, in these you know, pre-World Cup games. I think um, I'm really looking forward to watching it. They were down here a few weeks ago to train. Uh, you can see the, the physicality of their games definitely increased. Um, as we know, it's a very confrontational game anyway, but they've, they've taken that to another notch. I'm just interested to see what other little options come out of that. So I have no doubt Jay Schmidt will have something up his sleeve. And whether we see it pre-World Cup, uh, I'm not sure, but um, I'm looking forward to watching what happens there. Are we going to get past this quarterfinal this time? I hope so. Would you rather the All Blacks or the Springboks? Probably a stupid question. Well, 16 all draw on the weekend, so, mm. <laughs> you know, one's a crocodile, one's an alligator, you've got mm. to fight them both. So, I don't know, I, I, I'd, um, I, to me, it's, it's a, I reckon, you know, there's three really dangerous teams uh, outside of Ireland, um, and I think, you know, Springboks uh, are one, the All Blacks are another one, and England's another one, and I'd put Ireland up there, to me, they're the top four, and uh, you get into a semi-final, anything's going to happen. It's just unfortunate we have to play one of them in the uh, in the quarters to get yeah. there. 